guys, we're going to be turning the corner start after this week. This is the last week that we're focusing really on us and our relationship with the Lord. It's going to turn to relationships with others as we go into, as we go into the seventh beatitude. But today we're going to follow up and we're going to talk about happy are the hungry. Now, if, if we learn anything about Jesus so far, and if you haven't recognized it, Jesus is a master storyteller and a master teacher. He constantly used things that exist in our world that we see or we deal with to help us understand complex theological ideas. And we've already seen it. He he used poverty. We started there. Now, most of us aren't poor in the United States, but we understand poverty. We see it around us. And and he took that poverty to show how we really exist in our spiritual state. We are poor in spirit. We can't change ourselves, unable to change ourselves. If we want to see change, we've got to start with a problem, and this problem's inside of me. It's not outside of me, it's me. My heart has to change. And then he goes to, to grieving or mourning, which we all understand that deep internal struggle of pain uh, that just sets us aside and, and just hurts. But he talks about how God sees sin and how sin causes all these problems in our life. And we're now being able to see sin from God's perspective, what it's done to us, the damage it's caused, the deception it brought, and the death that it just told out on everybody. And we're allowed to repent then. And then we saw last week, we talked about gentleness. We can clearly understand that. Remember the definition? Bridled strength. We know what it means to see a wild animal like a horse broken to be put into service. We see those concepts. We understand them. But the fourth one today is going to be one that we really are not familiar with. We understand it. We comprehend it. But let's be honest, most of us have no experience, even in the United States, with what he's talking about. So let's read the verse. And it's going to be familiar to you, but I want us to understand it from Christ's perspective, what he's actually saying. It's Matthew 5, 6. Look in the notes or look in your Bible. Look what it said. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, this is presenting a topic, like I said, that we're really not truly understand. We've been hungry before and we've been thirsty, but that's not what he's talking about here. I started getting associated with this or understanding this on my first mission trip down to Chile where our interpreter, we were driving around the neighborhoods and we were really in an impoverished area. And I asked him what the children were doing around that dumpster. And they're probably five, six years old. And he goes, they're trying to eat. They're starving to death. Kids are crawling into the dumpster looking for food. And it was everywhere. So this is a level of hunger where Think about being in a famine for a long period of time and there's no food and you haven't eaten and it's coming to the point of death and you're desperate for food. You'll eat anything. I heard a story as I was studying this week, I read a story as I was studying this week about, uh, about an allied force, which was the British, the Australians, and the New Zealands, and they were liberating Palestine during World War I. And they began to drive the Turks out of Jerusalem. They were pursuing them across the desert. And they got to Beersheba. And when they got there, they had outpaced their water wagons, which was actually camels. So they had uh, uh, thousands of of military marching. And the men began to suffer from, obviously, thirst. The water ran out. And immediately their mouths got dry. And as their mouths got dry, they began to get dizzy. And as they got dizzy, uh, that turned into several of them fainting. Uh, their mouths became, began to swell, their lips began to swell, and hundreds of men began to die. But they were heading towards a, a well system that they knew that was coming, and they had to get to, and I'm going to get the name right here, give me one second, and it's in my note. I should have highlighted it, guys, I'm very sorry. The wells of Shariah, they knew there was a natural aqueduct, they could drink there, but they had to get there. They finally made it. When they got to the wells of Shariah, though, Think about this. There were thousands of men. And in that event, all of the sick, all of the wounded, and all of those who were the worst drank first. Those who were able-bodied soldiers had to stand by and guard the well from anybody running up and getting it. It took four hours to, for everyone to get water that day. Can you imagine being one of the guys on duty and you haven't had anything to drink for days? And you are just dying of thirst. And all you can think about is what is in that cistern. And you can't get to it because someone else has to. The one thing you've longed for and need, and you know if you don't get it, you're going to die, is just a few feet away from you. 
One of the officers was quoted, and I love what he said. It was a British officer. He said, I believe that we have now learned our first real biblical lesson on the march from, from Beersheba to Shariah. If such were our thirst for God, for His righteousness, and for His will in our lives, a consuming, all-embracing, preoccupying desire, how rich in the fruit of the Spirit would we all be? That's the kind of thirst and hunger that he's talking about in this. It is an all-consuming desire that I need you to hear right now that God creates in your heart. You can't create it. It comes from God. He designs it. He builds it. He makes it happen. So in regard to the story I just told you, to the idea of hunger and the idea of thirst, let me ask you a question, and I need you to be honest with yourself because I'm going to start the service with it. I'm going to end the service with it. When you look at your relationship with Christ, are you hungry and thirsty? Does that define your pursuit? Does that define your seeking? Does that define you? Are you hungry and are you thirsty? Now remember where God's taking us. I ask that question because God wants to take us from where we are to blessing. That's his goal. And God is working to create a growing desire in you, again, I, I want to emphasize this again and again and again. You cannot create this. It only comes from God. To help us understand it, God, again, uses the comparison to hunger and thirst. Now, Jesus chose hunger and thirst for a very, very important reason. Jesus chose hunger and thirst for a very, very important reason, actually reasons, and that is this. They, these are not, number one, created by you or controlled by you. They are natural, and your body creates them to remind you to eat and to drink. Have you ever been anywhere, and you start getting hungry, and your stomach growls? And it's just kind of that, you only hear it, you feel it, that it's in your stomach. Now, what happens if you don't feed your stomach? What happens if you don't eat? That, that pain gets louder, doesn't it? The hunger pain starts getting louder. The growling stomach gets louder and louder until finally everyone around you can hear it. Maybe it hits you at the end of lunch if I preach too long. You'll start feeling it. What is that? Well, your stomach was trying to tell you to eat, but you weren't listening to it and you didn't give it anything. So now it's telling everybody around you, hey, this cat's hungry. Does anybody have a Snickers? Does anybody got some Twinkies? Somebody feed this guy. He's hungry. You didn't control any of that. Matter of fact, what's it do? It usually embarrasses you. You kind of apologize, sorry. But everybody's had that happen. It's not something you control. It's not something you manage. It is something that God does in you and that he's using this to help us understand. And just as hunger and thirst are necessary for physical life, righteousness is necessary for spiritual life. Just like you need food and just like you need water for your physical well-being, you've got to have righteousness for your spiritual well-being. They work together. That's the other reason Jesus is using this. He goes, man does not live by bread alone. He's absolutely necessary for your spiritual life. So God is working to create this desire which resembles hunger and thirst. And he's using the strongest and deepest impulses in our physical world and in our life to represent the depth of desire that the blessed or the person who seeks him will receive, which is that kind of righteousness. You'll have this desire for righteousness. Now, I need you to understand something. The language in this verse is going to be very important today, and I'm going to talk about it in several places. I usually don't talk about Greek words or anything like that unless it actually plays into the meaning and understanding and application of the text, and here it does, because it, the word that is associated with the actual, the, the verb, is continual. It, it, it's simply this. This is not just going to be an event it's not going to be eat, I'm hungry, I'm done. Just as you are continually hungry and continually thirsty, there's a growing desire, a consistent call to seek God's righteousness. You want more. It's continual. So he's comparing it to that for a very important reason. Now, here's the reason why. Listen to this. A starving person has a single all-consuming desire a hungry person has a single all-consuming desire. He has a desire for food. A thirsty person has a desire for drink. 
Nothing else will satisfy him. Nothing else will get his attention. Nothing else will pull him away. Nothing else will appeal to him. Nothing else will attract him. Now apply that to your life spiritually. If I'm truly hungering and thirsting for God's righteousness, all these attractions, all these appeals, all these things I'm fighting for will become less and less appealing because now I'm hungering for the true source of life. That's why he compares it to hunger and thirst. That's why he wants to change it in us. But he doesn't just have the comparison to hunger and thirst. Read the rest of the verse. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, notice something. There is a compulsion for righteousness. Now, we need to understand the definition of righteousness here. Because Matthew's very specific. He's not using the entire definition. But the basic definition means right, just, or righteous. I'm right with God, I have been made just by Christ, and I want God's justice to prevail. That's the overall definition of the idea of righteousness. So if we take all that and just put it down, it means conformity to all that God commands and all that God says and all that God appoints. So righteousness is I'm going to conform to what God commands, what God says, and what God asks of me. I'm going to do it. I'm going to conform my life. I'm going to follow it. I'm going to obey it. Righteousness is this. Righteousness is I am putting God's commands priority of my life. He is God. He's never wrong. He is God. What he says is true. He is God. What he commands and promises happens. God always operates in righteousness because he is righteous. So I am now conforming, adjusting my life to him, his word, his commands, and all that he says. So righteousness for us is a state that God has commanded us. God commands every man to be righteous. Now understand it's also the position that you hold that you can withstand judgment. That your righteousness is enough that when you go before God, you're right with him. You're just before him. There is no sin. Now, we automatically hear that. We know our problem. We're born sinners. That's why the cross is so necessary. When you got saved and you came to Christ, you admitted your sin. You admitted you're unrighteous. You admitted you don't deserve to be in God's presence. It's your fault. You chose this. You're born this way. Your actions prove it. But Jesus never did. Jesus was fully righteous. He never sinned. His life was perfect in every way, and he stood perfect before his Father. So what did he do? He died in your place. And the Bible says we exchanged. He took our sin and gave us his righteousness. The only way to stand before God to endure judgment is you have to be perfect. And the only way you can be perfect is if you have the righteousness of Christ. And that only comes through putting your faith in him. Period. There's no other way. Now that's the general idea of righteousness. But Matthew's not talking about that here. Matthew's not focusing on the concept of being just before God or justification or all these other ideas. He's talking about something else. Matthew, throughout his entire book, is focused on right behavior, right conduct, living in a way that God has asked us to live or has commanded us to live. That's what Matthew's focus is. So hunger becomes, I wholly desire to obey God from my heart. I wholly desire to let God's justice be done everywhere. Not just justice. Everybody's grabbing justice now. Everybody is defining justice the way they want to. But this is wanting God's justice to be done. That God's rights to be done. This is a desire for my life to be fully and wholly obedient following Him. And it is also desiring that His justice takes place not only on earth, but all around us. And you know you're getting to that point when all unrighteousness begins to grieve you. When you begin to see unrighteousness, when you begin to see sin, you begin to see the deception someone's in, the damage it's causing, the death it's bringing, and you grieve it. Remember what mourning was about? We see sin from God's perspective. We feel about it the way He does. So we begin to grieve when we see it out there and we're wanting God's justice, we're wanting His righteousness to invade their lives, their sins to be forgiven, and them to stand before God clean because we know what's coming if they don't. That's part of what Matthew's talking about. I wholly desire God's uh, a heart that follows, that, that pursues Him, that desires to obey Him, not perfectly, but that's my desire, and I want that for other people. I want God's justice to speak this way. Now, this is where 
the Greek is important. Because this is where it's going to direct us to what this righteousness is taking us to. What does he mean when he says righteousness? It's such a broad topic. Well, the language actually kind of takes it and funnels it down to the point. Because in this, usually when we see the word hunger and thirst in Greek, many times they always have an object attached to it. Now, that object that's in the Greek actually makes it incomplete. Now, let me define what that means. So, when you use words like hunger and thirst, it's incomplete in thought, meaning a person is hungry for some food. A a person is thirsty for some water. They're not thirsty for all the food. They're not thirsty for all the water. Once they get food, they're fine. Once they get water, they're fine. That's usually what's associated, but Jesus doesn't associate it that way. He makes it in an accusative form, which means simply this, when you see it in the accusative form, it means it's unqualified and unlimited. So you're not asking for some righteousness. You want all the righteousness. All the righteousness. Now, no, notice something else. When you look at your text, notice what it says for righteousness. Well, in the Greek, there is a the in front of the word righteous. There's an article there. And he's not talking about some righteousness. He's talking about the righteousness, the very righteousness of God. You want what God possesses. You want all of his righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God. So notice what this actually means. I have a hunger and a growing thirst, a continual hunger and a continual thirst for God himself. This has nothing more than this. I have gone from being selfish and life is about me in poverty of spirit to now I'm hungering and thirsting for God. Do you see the change? Do you see the change? He wants to take you from where you are to where one thing, the focus of your heart, is you are thirsting and hungering for more of God. You've been convinced of one thing. He is the only source of life. He has the words of life. Where else can I get them? And I want just him. And I can't get enough. You can't create that. There's no Bible study that creates, no podcast will create that. It's only God that can create that. Matter of fact, it's so important that we understand this. We need to understand the progression of God changing you. Let me show you what I mean by this. There's two principles I want you to see in this passage especially. The first one is, the more you put aside, the more longing, the more you you long for what God provides. The more you put aside, the more you long for what God provides. Now, I want you to look at the progression of the Beatitudes. This shows you what I'm talking about. We started over here in poor in spirit. What does that have to do with selfishness? If we want to change anything, uh, if we want something to be different, we've got to start the cause of the problem, and the cause of the problem is me. And guess what? I'm the problem, and I don't have the ability to fix it in myself. If I could have fixed it, I already would have, but I can't. Well, that leads us to grieving or mourning, which is what? We're dealing with sin and repentance. And that leads us to gentleness, which is what? Submission to God. Do you see the progression? In each step... God is changing us, and in each step of the three, he's leading us to this one, which allows us to seek God now. That he's put in us a desire to absolutely, completely, and totally seek him. See, when you put aside sin, and you repent of sin, and you submit to God, you're now blessed with a growing desire, with a hunger and thirst for him. More of him. Worshiping him. You just want him. And it redefines all your life. Matter of fact, we learned something. God doesn't eliminate. He enriches. When you start down here, I'm going to tell you something, guys, especially in poverty of spirit and having to mourn, it feels like you're giving up so much. It feels like God is tearing you apart at times. You've had patterns of thinking and action that you've followed your entire life that are selfish motivated, that are buried in this ideas of the world, and God has to change that because you don't see it. And it's difficult, especially when you begin to see your selfishness in the eyes of someone you love. When your selfishness hurts them. When you clearly see that it really isn't them, it's you. Wait a minute, I thought this was your problem, but I realize it's mine. See, God doesn't just come down and say, you're selfish. God lets your selfishness play out, and you get to, for the first time your eyes open, you go, I really am selfish. I caused this problem. I'm the source of this problem. 
I have to take full responsibility for it. You have to, listen to this, humble yourself. And it hurts. And it feels like, okay, God, all I see is all these problems, all these problems, all these problems. I need you to remember something. God is not trying to eliminate. God is trying to enrich. He's taking you to blessedness. You've been living in selfishness. You've been living in sin. You've been living in not submission. God has to change all that to get you where you need to be. He's trying to enrich you. I want you to think of the prodigal son, the younger brother, the son's the younger brother. Two pictures that you need to remember when you're going through this. First one, he's in the pig pen, and he's starving. Do you remember that? He's covered in filth. He's working with pigs, and he's starving. He's picking up a handful of pods, which are only fit for pigs to eat because they had leather skin, and they tasted like dirt. That sounds delicious. Sounds like going to a vegan restaurant. But anyway, he picks it up, and he's wanting to eat this, and he's starving. But let me see a second picture. Where do we see the second picture? We see a young man clothed in his father's robe the Father's righteousness, or Christ's righteousness. We see him wearing the ring, which is what? The presence of the Holy Spirit. We see him putting on sandals. Why? Because he's a child of the Father. And where is he? He's sitting in a love feast, celebrating his Father, fully satisfied in the presence of his dad. Two pictures. But notice what had to happen. He had to come to the point to realize what? Servants in my Father's house have it better than me. My life choices have been selfish and wrong. I need to repent. And what happened? He ends up in his Father's presence more satisfied than he could ever be. That's what God wants to do. It's going to hurt over here a little bit, but you've got to die a little bit today to live better tomorrow. That's why this isn't preached a lot. It doesn't sell tapes. Well, we don't do tapes anymore. That's just my age. It doesn't sell. It doesn't really make you feel good. But God knows that sometimes things have to change for you to get to the point of being blessed. But you can see the progression of God changing you. He wants to, he doesn't want to eliminate, he wants to enrich. Now, when that comes to that point, notice what God's going to do. Look at God's promise to the hungry. Look at God's promise to the hungry. How do I know, Brad? How can I recognize spiritual hunger? How do I see it in my life? When this starts changing, what am I going to see at first? Let me just give you four really quick things. And I included this. I normally don't, but I want you to see this. Number one, notice what happens. You have a growing dissatisfaction with sin and self. The person who's pleased with their own self-righteousness, the older brothers that we talked about, they have no need for God. They see no desire for God. They don't want God. But the more you become aware that you're unable and that you are at fault, and this is my sin and my problem, the more you run to God because you can't fix it. If you have a growing dissatisfaction with that sin that always satisfied you, that purpose that's of the world, not God, that satisfied you, and selfishness, you begin to realize spiritual hunger is becoming, God's changing my appetite. And then you begin to realize that external things cannot satisfy. External things cannot satisfy. We can drive around town all we want, and we see people holding up signs that say, we'll work for food, please help. But you know what I've never seen anybody do? I've never seen anybody walk up and go, listen, I, I see your sign. Let me give you a bouquet of flowers. Why? That's stupid. That's a great gift, but a hungry person doesn't want a bouquet of flowers. They want food. They, they want what satisfies them. You're going to come to the point where you realize there's nothing in this world that satisfies your real hunger. He is life. He is the words of life. Jesus Christ himself said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and obey his word. You begin to realize my only source of satisfaction comes from God. When you begin to realize the things you've been trying to get life from don't satisfy you more. Guess what? Physical hunger is coming. God is changing your desires. Then you'll have a growing desire to be in God's word. A growing desire to be in God's word. Why? It is his source of food for the believer. And you want Jesus without conditions. You want Jesus without conditions. The spiritually hungry just want Jesus, and they will seek and accept righteousness regardless of how he provides it. Guys, I need to understand something. The greatest lessons I've heard, learned from God have not been in blessing. They've been in tragedy. It's been in pain, and it's been in suffering. But it's in those where God has freed me the most. And I know my Father loves me, and I know He has what's good for me, even when it's bad, and I can accept it, that God's doing something in me. I may not like the circumstances, but I understand the heart of my Father, and in that I have grown more than I ever have in good conditions. But because I want Christ, the conditions don't matter. 
And I'm not coming to God with something else along the way. I'm not coming to God. I don't, the spiritual hunger, you don't ask for economic blessing or personal satisfaction or power. They just want Christ. They need what he provides because they trust him. They trust him. When you see these in your life, they're not negative. Your hunger and your desire is growing. But what's the reward, what is the reward to the hungry? What does God do for them? Well, what it says. They will be satisfied. Now, I'm not trying to be offensive, <laughs> but this is the definition of satisfied. Another word picture. <clears throat> it's continually feeding an animal so that animal is completely satisfied. That's the picture. It's a farming term. Everyone there that Jesus is speaking to probably had animals. They're probably raising those animals, and they probably had to feed those animals, and they understood what it meant to get them satisfied. But the person who's hungry will be satisfied. Now notice it shows something here. It shows our cooperation with Christ. We seek, he satisfies. Now he's created the desire, but here's what he's saying. As you seek, I'll satisfy. As you seek, I'll satisfy. As you seek me, as that desire grows, follow it, continue to seek me, and I will satisfy you. But there's a paradox in this hunger, guys. Because the more we seek, the more we hunger. And the more we hunger, the more we're satisfied. It is a satisfaction that keeps bringing us back. But notice what all that's doing. It's pointing to that day we just sang about. Where I see him in his face for the first time. And I'm fully satisfied like I've never been before. All of it says there's a day coming that's greater than this. There's a day coming greater than this. There's a day of satisfaction I cannot wait for. You will be satisfied. You will be blessed. But I want to see the last thing. What's the result of the spiritual hunger? Let me finish today with a story. This gives you the idea. Jesus had been invited to a Pharisee's house for dinner. His name was Simon. Jesus comes to dinner. He sits down. But as he's eating, there's a woman, a sinner. She's known as a sinner. She was defined as a sinner. The Pharisees even saw her as a sinner. They knew who she was. They knew her life. And they knew what she was. Sneaks into the dinner party. Now, at dinner parties like this, guests were welcome from the outside. They didn't have to be invited because they wanted to listen to the conversation. And she slipped in. She sits behind Jesus or stands behind Jesus. And she starts to cry. Not just crying, bawling. Tears are flowing. It's, it's audible. She kneels at his feet. And all of a sudden, the tears begin to fall on his feet. And she begins to wipe the tears of her hair. She begins to kiss his feet. She begins to pour oil on his feet, perfume on his feet, and massage it in. Now the Pharisee Simon sees this and he thinks to himself, if he truly was a prophet, speaking of Jesus, you know exactly that woman's a sinful woman. He wouldn't let him touch her. He's obviously not a man of God. Now Jesus knows what he's thinking. He knows what we're all thinking. And he said, Simon, let me tell you a story. There's two debtors. One owes a king 50 denarii, a day's wage. The other owes 500. Neither of them can pay. He forgives them both. Which one is more grateful? He said, the one that was forgiven the most. Is you told, that's your correct answer. He goes, you see this woman at my feet? Never calls her name out. I love that. He goes, when I came in this place, you didn't welcome me with a kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't offer me water to wash my feet, but she's washed them with her tears and dried them with her hair. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with perfume. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven because he who has forgiven much loves much. Now the people around them goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Who's this man that he can forgive sins? Who is he? And he turn around to the woman and he goes, go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Your sins are forgiven. I've always asked one question. Why did she come to this party? Why would this woman risk this kind of scorn knowing she's going into a Pharisee's house that hates her? Jesus had been preaching in the city of Magdala. And he had just preached a message with a very famous invitation. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. He's comparing the hunger and thirst with weariness. Change them out. Take my yoke upon you. Because my burden is easy and light. For I am humble and gentle of heart. 
Believe in me is what he was saying. And in that moment, that woman believed in Christ. Whatever her lifestyle was, it doesn't matter. But in that moment, she says, I don't want this anymore. I see how this sin has destroyed me. She realized I'm poor in spirit. I am selfish. I have been destroyed. She begins to mourn. This life has just wrecked me. And she comes and she submits to God. And she says, I believe in Christ. I will follow you. I don't want this anymore. I want you. So she had to get to Jesus. She had to get to Jesus. She just wanted to be with Jesus. She didn't care where it was. She didn't care what she looked like. She didn't care what anybody said. She didn't care. She had to be at his feet. She had to wet his feet with her tears because she's so thankful for her grace. She's no longer the same person. She just has to kiss his feet and pour with the perfume to tell him, you're all that matters to me. You're my life. I've left all this for you. I want you. Thank you. She becomes a worshiper. Folks, we're not called to worship. We're called to be worshipers. Worship's what you do. Worshiper is who you are. You know the result of spiritual hunger? The heart that just wants Christ and nothing else. A hungry man is not attracted, allured, or easily pulled from that which he's focused on in his hunger. So I'm going to ask you again. Are you hungry? Be honest. Has your passion for Christ descended to church attendance only? Occasional reading of the Bible. Some principles you follow. Your prayer life has gotten dry. It's about God bless me, God bless me, or God I got a problem, God I got a problem. And let's be honest. It's empty. It no longer has to be. We've already talked about every step. Where do I start? God, I realize that I'm probably the problem here. But I need you to do something because I cannot. Father, I want to go from here to blessed. Please work in me. Open my eyes. Soften my heart. Renew my passion. As David said, bring back the joy of my salvation. And let me long for nothing but you. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, are you hungry for Christ? If you're not, that just says this. If you're a believer, that means one thing. You need grace. It's not a time to beat yourself up. It's not a time to say, oh, poor pitiful me. It's a time to look up and say, I'm not where I need to be and I need your grace, Father. I can't change this, but you can. And I'm going to seek you and I'm going to hang on like Jacob wrestled with the angel or wrestled with pre incarnate Christ. I'm going to wrestle till you answer. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here and I want nothing but you. Change me by your grace. Take a moment and pray, believer. Take a moment and tell him, renew my passion. Bring back the joy of my salvation, please. Please. I'm going to give you a second to just pray. Talk with God. Believer, you keep talking. You may be here for the first time you realize something. You're lost. Salvation wasn't what I described. Uh, You wanted Jesus in your heart, so you got out of hell. You never really realized that you were a sinner. You're born that way. You've desired that. You deserve that. And that's directed your life to this point. But this morning you realize something. I'm a sinner. I'm separated from God. And if I stood for Him today, my life would not stand up to His judgment because I'm not covered in Christ's righteousness. But I want to be. I want to be able to stand before God knowing that when He sees me, He doesn't see my sin. It's covered by Christ. He sees His Son's perfection in me. I'm ready to believe that I can't do this on my own. 
and I desperately need Jesus. If that's you, then all you got to do this morning is admit that's Christ. I'm a sinner. I deserve what you say happens, which is death, and I can do nothing about it. Just tell him that. If that's what you believe, agree with that. This is honestly the truth. I see it. The Bible says believe in Christ. I realize and admit Jesus, I believe that Jesus is the only source of salvation, and I trust in his sacrifice on the cross and nothing else. And then confess. What's that mean? Receive the gift he's offering you. He's saving you. You're saying yes. That's it. You're coming by faith and saying, I trust you. Matter of fact, let me lead you in this prayer. Dear Jesus, say this with me. Dear Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. Sin describes me. It's what I desire. And I deserve what you said. I deserve death. I've earned it. But I I, I can't face you that way, Father. I know I'll face you someday, and I don't want to face you like that. So I believe in Christ. I believe in His sacrifice. I believe it's the only way for my sin to be forgiven and me to be right, because I can't do it. Only you can. So I confess. I receive your gift today, God. Thank you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You can all look at me.